so I said, well, I'm going to Google this person. Technical guy kind of behind the other person without a tie. So welcome. To, it's our pleasure today to have uh, Professor Jennifer Barton, who holds a joint appointment in optical sciences as well as biomedical engineering. She's currently the interim director of the Bio5 Institute and in the past has been acting um, vice president for research and um, was founding department head of the biomedical engineering department when it was formed, I'll say five years ago, but it was probably 15. Um, so today, uh, Dr. Barton is going to tell us about miniature optical endoscopes for early stage cancer detection. Well, thank you, and good afternoon. Can you all hear me okay? Okay, perfect. All right, so I'd love to talk about the research that I'm doing. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come present it to you. My work is motivated by looking for early stage cancer. The idea is that if we can catch cancer early, it's usually curable. Unfortunately, most of the time, cancer is caught when it's distant, in which case the five-year survival rate plummets. And this is due to a whole number of factors, and a lot of those are cancer specific, but at least one of them is due to the fact that our current clinically enabled imaging modalities are generally low resolution. This is an MRI image of the female pelvis, and as part of that, you can see in this image, you can see, for instance, the ovaries, and if you had a big mass on the ovaries, then you could certainly see that with MRI. But by the time you have a big mass on the ovaries, that means you're probably in stage three or four cancer. It's probably metastasized throughout the abdomen, and it's really, um, unfortunately, probably too late for the patient. So what we would rather do, being optical scientists and engineers, is that we would like to be able to use optics to get a very close look instead of this whole body image, if we could zoom in and see the cells, see the microstructure, see the cell nuclei, see what was going on at a very detailed stage, that's what you need to catch the early stages of cancer. The early stages of cancer are not going to be big masses. They're going to be subtle changes in the thickness of the layers of the ovaries and fallopian tubes or colon or whatever organ you're looking at. They're going to be changes in the cells themselves. So if we take a look at this and we take our whole armamentarium of imaging modalities and we plot them on resolution on the y-axis and depth of penetration on the x-axis, you unfortunately have a case where as you get better and better resolution, you get less and less depth of penetration. So our clinical modalities like MRI and CT are really excellent because they can see through the whole body, but with a millimeter or maybe slightly better resolution, they're not going to help you. We really want to be down there in this bottom right-hand corner where we could see through the entire body with cellular level resolution. And unfortunately, we haven't yet invented that um, imaging technique. Instead, we have this trade-off, which means that if we want to use modalities that can image at the tissue microstructure or cellular scale, access becomes a challenge. We've got to get right to the organ of interest. So fortunately, that's one of the things that we work on here, is how to build miniature endoscopes to actually get to the organ you want to see in the least invasive way possible. So I work on a couple of different imaging modalities, and the one that I use the most in my lab is called optical coherence tomography. So this is a reflected near-infrared light technique that images tissue microstructure. So you have you know, a few micron resolution, one to two millimeter imaging depth, looking at reflected light. So the one to two millimeter imaging depth doesn't necessarily seem like it's all that much, but if you view the fact that most cancers in the body occur on your epithelium, and your epithelium covers all the organs in your body, it's your skin, the conjunctiva of your eye, the lining of the inside of your intestine and your esophagus, the covering of the ovaries and the fallopian tubes, that's where cancer arises. And it's not, under normal circumstances, more than about 100 microns thick, much less a millimeter. So a little bit more about it for those of you who are not familiar with the technology. It's ultrasound with light is the way I like to think about it. So you have a portion of a light wave incident on the tissue, and it's re as that penetrates into the tissue, every time you hit an index of refraction mismatch, a portion of the wave will be reflected. And so if we can just time how long it took for the wave to go into the tissue and come back out knowing the speed of light, we can range that distance to that index of refraction mismatch. And of course, the signal strength will tell you something about the magnitude of that mismatch. Um, so, uh, 
with ultrasound, you really just do this with pulse echo. You put in a pulse of sound and you listen for the echoes. Light travels too fast for that, but we can use interferometric methods for being able to do so. It's really outstanding technique for mapping the microstructure of tissue, so tens of micron scale. And the other nice thing about OCT is it's really robust. You know, it's not one of those that has to be put on an isolated vibration table. You can hit it, you can knock it. It's a robust technique. I've just shown a couple of examples here. This is human skin from a volunteer. The normal skin is over here. You see a layered structure, and we can actually see things like follicles deep within the dermis. We have this kind of really odd-looking mushroom-like thing here, which is actually hyperkeratosis. That's an early stage of squamous cell carcinoma. And so we're looking for how big is that? Has it penetrated? Has it disrupted the layers of the tissue? No, not yet. So it's not yet cancer. Uh, here's another example. This is a rabbit artery that's had a stent placed in it, you know, a wire mesh to keep the artery open. Um, because stents are metal, we get a bright reflection from the surface of that and a dark shadow underneath because the light can't go through the metal. But we can see the different layers in there. And here we're looking for a nice, smooth neoentema that has grown over the stents and is covering up the stents from the blood. This is actually, if any of you ever later in life need a stent, this is the healing response you hope for. And finally down here, this is a mouse colon. So I just wanted to point out this whole image is only a half a millimeter deep. So we can see all the structures of the colon. Um, not that I expect you to know what they are, but you can no doubt see that there are bright lines here, and those lines delineate the changes in the boundary as well as the, the normal crypt structure. This is perfectly normal healthy. So the problem with OCT, though, is, is although you can do all kinds of tricks with OCT and you can extract molecular information and Doppler information and other things under certain circumstances, its strength really is in just providing an anatomical image. And we'd really like to combine that with something that told us about the tissue function. And so in that case, we combine it with laser-induced fluorescence, which will um, sense some molecular information. This can either be naturally occurring or some sort of dye that we add. And the other nice thing about laser-induced fluorescence is it's just super simple. Again, these things are really important if you're going to have a clinical translatable um, technology. Things have to be simple. You just dump excitation light on the tissue. It excites either the natural or the exogenous fluorophores there. They all emit isotropically, and you collect a portion of that light. You send it to a spectrometer, and you analyze what came back. So um, the tissue emission spectra are a mixture. It's dependent upon the fluorophore concentration. Usually that's what we're trying to figure out. Depth, quantum yield, the attenuation of tissue and attenuation from chromophores like blood. Um, there's lots of different naturally occurring ones. And, and so if we can get away without having to apply a dye, that also makes things more clinically translatable. We can look at tryptophan, metabolic factors like NADH and FAD, structural proteins like collagen, elastin, and keratin, and also hemoglobin breakdown products like porphyrin are all highly fluorescent, and we can use this. Or if we want to get more specificity and sensitivity, a lot of times you will apply an exogenous dye that can be targeted. So those are the techniques. Now we've got to figure out how we're going to use them to answer a clinical problem. And really, there's two. The first is, how do we get the microscope into the body? That's an engineering question. That's what you students are learning how to do right now and, and what we do a lot of in my lab. The other problem is a little trickier, and we also work on that, which the nice way is how do we correlate image features with disease? Or another way of sensing it is how do we know what the heck we're seeing? Sometimes we're the very first people to ever look at a particular type of tissue with OCT or another technique, and you get this image back, and you're like, Wow, that's really interesting. I wonder what in the heck we're looking at, because the mechanism of contrast is so very different than anything you've seen before. It's different than MRI. It's different than ultrasound. It's different than the pink and purple, you know, pickled and stained um, histology sections that, that are the gold standard in our field. So we oftentimes have to go into an iterative process where we define the problem. We maybe build an endoscope in a way that we think will solve the problem. We test it out on the benchtop doing all the standard you know, resolution charts and measurements of dynamic range and things like that. We'll go and we'll do some mouse studies or some human studies. We'll analyze the data. And more often than not, we'll realize we kind of partly got the way there, but we didn't actually build the technology the way we needed it to to answer the clinical problem. And so we go back and around again in what I call um, bedside to bench.
And that's okay. It's okay to go through the cycle multiple times. That's typical for clinical translation. So getting back to that first step, though, you know, developmental imaging systems, I'm, you know, showing, bearing my soul here, my, my messy lab, and these big bulky systems with fibers and wires running everywhere and um, gigantic laser systems and big enclosures and stuff. And this is all great for working with, but you're not going to wheel this into the operating room. So we need to make something that looks more like this, which is what the uh, physician is used to seeing, used to using. Is there a way that we can take our advanced optical imaging techniques, patches, package them into something that looks more like a, a you know, colonoscope as shown here? Um, and um, yet provide the additional power that our advanced techniques that these simple white light, just visual um, instruments don't have. So I'm going to kind of go through how I've done this for two different examples. Um, the first is looking at colon cancer in a mouse model. And you might wonder why we care about colon cancer in mice. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, colon cancer itself is a really important cancer. It's the third most common cancer in the world and the, and the third leading cause of cancer death. Um, it's really highly preventable. So if we, could, if we could catch colon cancer early, and we know we can do colonoscopy, it's not that colonoscopy doesn't exist. It's that the colonoscopes we use right now miss flat lesions. They miss lots of things that come up and turn out to be problems later on because they just didn't catch them. They weren't big polyps, so we didn't see them. Um, also, from a developmental standpoint, this is really good for us because mouse models are really predictable, right? We can create a mouse model, we can follow the course of disease, we can go back and we can test our endoscopes in it. The other one that I'll tell you about is looking at human um, ovarian cancer imaging. And ovarian cancer is really much more challenging. They're, they're unlike for colon cancer, there's no colonoscopy for ovarian cancer now. There is no screening technique that works. It's very deadly, and it's very difficult to access the ovaries, and which is one reason why screening doesn't exist. So we've done this roundabout with us a couple of times now, starting with a rigid laparoscope, and then I'll, our, we've recently benchtop prototyped a flexible fallopiscope. So I'll get into that. So if we think about endoscopes, really all, the, all an endoscope needs to do is relay information from inside of the body to outside of the in, uh, body. And so um, that sounds simple, but it can get pretty complicated pretty quickly. And there's a couple of things we need to consider when we're developing our endoscopes. The first is whether or not they're rigid or flexible. It's you, generally easier to build a rigid endoscope because you can use things like rod lenses. You don't have to worry about using fiber optics. Um, you can use stainless steel tubes, which are nice and robust and put up with the physicians who sometimes like to think their medical instruments are crowbars and you know, things get abused in the operating room. So that's, that's easier. If you need to make it flexible, then you have to start using fibers and polymers and flexible sheaths and, and it just adds a level of complexity. Um, length and diameter constraints, this is usually driven by the anatomy, but it also means that, that if you have a very short endoscope, you can get away with materials and design choices you can't with longer ones that maybe have a tortuous path. Do you have to use any scanning? Can you just put a fiber bundle like the dumb colonoscopes that we have nowadays or just fiber bundles where you, you put light in and you collect light back and nothing moves? Or is this, are you using a technique like OCT where you have to scan? In which case, can you figure out some way of scanning on the proximal end outside of the body or do you have to put that scanning mechanism inside the endoscope? Do you need to steer? Is this something where you have to choose between paths and a tube or you have to avoid certain structures? Again, that will add to complexity and size. And finally, biocompatibility and sterilizability. And um, you know, as, as Ray Kostick and I know from going through um, having a change in the sterilization process that was used, all of a sudden we have to withstand hydrogen peroxide, not just ethylene oxide. And hydrogen peroxide um, and glues don't go together very well. So um, you have to be careful about your choices of material. Finally, things need to be smooth, lubricious, pushable, kink-free, all those kinds of things that you would expect for ease of operation and avoiding harming tissues. 
So I told you I was going to talk about two applications. I'm going to give you three examples. The first two are from the mouse colonoscope, um, where we have more experience. And then finally, I'll, I'll talk about our um, experience building the fallopian tube endoscope. And they all have, I don't need to go through all of this, but the point is that they are different in terms of being rigid or flexible. They're very different lengths. Um, some of them view an image out the front, some an image out the side. They all have scanning of one form or another. Um, and then the, the bottom one actually does have to have steering. Okay, so going back to the mouse colonoscopes, and um, you know, some of you who have been here for a while may recognize some of the optical sciences students in these pictures as I go through. So scientific discovery and drug development happens in mice, right? You have to test out new compounds in mice first. And usually the way it was done, when I got here, I went and talked to the people who were doing this drug discovery, and I said, oh, well, how do you know whether or not your compound works in mice? They said, well, we take 100 mice, we give 50 of them the drug, we give 50 a placebo, and we sacrifice 10 every week for, uh, of each category for five weeks. And we take a look at whether the, we have more or less tumors at the end of the period than at the beginning. And they said, that's a really terrible way to do science when it involves an awful lot of mice, and we'd really like to minimize our use of animals in research. And two, it's also bad because you can only then statistically compare groups. Well, you really want to follow the same mouse five times over five weeks and see whether or not the tumors got bigger or they shrunk. And if there's not a tumor there, you don't really know whether there was one that got treated and went away or whether it was never there to begin with. So... They said, we can do mouse colonoscopy, this is easy, especially in a mouse because it's a straight shot for the first 40 millimeters. So we created a, a colonoscope that combines both OCT and fluorescence imaging. And this um, endoscope is inserted in the mouse and we get the it's structural and molecular information back. So the first thing that we did was a very, very simple, simple classic OCT endoscope. And I'll call this classic because this has been done by several different groups. We have our own twist on it, but it's very effective. And in terms of you know, walking through what's happening, you have a single mode fiber that's bringing light to a lens system. This is just a spacer to allow the beam to expand. Then we have a grin lens that focuses, that, and then this is a rod prism. It's, it's just rod shaped because that form factor is convenient, but it's just designed to send the light out the side of the endoscope, goes through the glass envelope and focuses in the tissue. Here's a picture of the system as built and just another cartoon of it. And um, so this is very simple, very robust. We do things like make it 48 degrees rather than 45 because we don't want back reflections from the glass coming back into our system. Um, and there's other little tricks you play, but, but basically, um, you get really good resolution out of an endoscope with something like this, about six microns in both axial and lateral. Now, if we want to hook this up into a scanning system, this is also really easy. This is a rigid system, so we can just hold the glass envelope stationary and we can move the optics inside. We can push and pull them and we can rotate them if we have a fiber optic rotary joint in there. And if you rotate and pull back, then you end up with a helical or a spiral scan. And so we've built that in there, and you can get um, all kinds of, of great three-dimensional information then out of your subject. So what does it look like? Here's an example of single rotational scan. So you have to imagine that we've taken this. The top here is, is the lumen or the inside of the colon. And normally it would have been wrapped around, but we've kind of virtually sliced it and folded it open. And if you look at a normal healthy colon, you've got layers of, of the colonic mucosa, the submucosa, the maxillaris, you know, whatever. The, the fine point is that these are nice layered structures. All those boundaries are distinct. If you start getting disease, you get something that looks like this where you get a big adenoma, you know, a big tumor that basically has taken over and is growing. This one is rather large for effect, but we can see small ones too. But what this scope allows us to do is that then when we take those spiral scans, not just a single rotational scan, but we now then do a pullback as well, but we're doing the same thing. We'll take it, we'll virtually slice it, fold it open, and in this case do a projection image so that you can look at the entire 3D data set just really easily. This is what you get. So there is a ton of information in here. We can see the wrinkles in the colon. We can see some fur. We can see other structures there. And if we zoom in on this little box, then we see the normal healthy crypt structure there, and that compares very favorably with a gold standard of histology. 
Whereas if we have a mouse that is diseased, all of a sudden we start seeing other things. We can trace the tumors, we can count them, we can get very accurate in vivo counts of tumors, and we know exactly what's happening. And then furthermore, we follow this over time and see whether or not our drug treatment worked. If we zoom in again, we can start seeing that things are different. Um, although I said that most of the time OCT is really good for these types of just structural images, kind of just telling you what's going on with, without having to sacrifice the mouse, um, you can do all of the same tricks that you can do with ultrasound. You can actually get some spectral information back that can tell you molecular information. You can look at the phase, and if you look at the phase, you can do Doppler imaging. So this is kind of a heavily processed example. Here's the amplitude image up above here. And here is a phase image that actually I've just turned into binary. Each one of these red and blue dots is a blood vessel with blood flowing one direction or the other. That's the red and the blue. And um, when I uh, told um, that we weren't, you know, I wasn't convinced that this wasn't just noise that we were imaging, um, we actually looked at a mouse that had been euthanized. And sure enough, there is no Doppler flow anymore, which is what you would expect. So this would actually be really healthy, hel helpful if you wanted to look at how blood vessels changed in cancer development. So that, that was good, but that was OCT only. We wanted to, to um, do some work where we uh, took an example and, and combined this with fluorescence imaging. So in this case, we did something a little more complicated. This is a cross-sectional cartoon showing where we have a fiber bundle in blue with the OCT fibers around it, and then just a ferrule in, in the glass envelope. And if we look at it in another way, it's essentially the same type of design. Here's our glass spacer. Here's our grin lens. Here's our prism to direct light out the side. We have a stop here to make sure that, that we don't have internal reflection. Um, but you know, essentially, we're doing the same thing. We're focusing the OCT into the tissue and back. The fluorescence, um, we're putting excitation light into the tissue and the light, the fluorescent light that is coming back again through the fiber bundle. And so again, this, this scans also by longitudinal and rotational movement inside of the aqua colored envelope here. Um, and one of the things that I think you OPSI students will appreciate, if anybody's worked with grin lenses, you know they have terrible chromatic dispersion. And also, in, an, in a system like this, um, we get a lot of asymmetry and our field is not flat. And actually, through a lot of clever work, one of my optical sciences graduate students figured out that we could use that to our advantage because the fluorescent light is in the visible. So that comes through and it focuses. And due to um, the asymmetries in the system, it actually focused to a curved surface that matched, we could force it to match pretty well the curvature of the envelope. So we managed to pretty much image the surface of the colon. Whereas the OCT was a longer wavelength that was in the near infrared, and just by the natural dispersion in the um, chromatic dispersion in the Grin lens, it focused about 100 microns deeper. And so that was actually ideal because for OCT, you'd like it to image inside the tissue, whereas for imaging, we wanted to image the surface of the tissue. So here's, you know, aberrations are not always bad. Sometimes you can use them to your advantage. So the types of images we got from that, um, looking at the fluorescence imaging channel, when we looked at a normal healthy mouse, we, say, we see this looks a little bit like the OCT images before, right? Um, where we see these regular patterns. We actually saw two different types, but in both cases, you kind of had a general homogeneous distribution of crypt structures here. Whereas if we looked at a mouse that had been given carcinogen but didn't have any of those big adenoma tumors yet, um, we actually were pretty glad that with this modality, we couldn't see this with OCT, but with this modality, we could see changes in the crypt structure where you start getting, ab you know, these are kind of slit-shaped or oval-shaped as opposed to nice and round. Some of them are bright, some of them are dim. This type of inhomogeneity was indicative of something going wrong with this animal at the very, very earliest stages. These are just, you know, very, very microstructural changes, not something you would ever pick up with a conventional colonoscope. So we think that this um, technology might actually have some real value uh, commercially. I said we could do time serial imaging, so I wanted to show you how we could do this. This is an example of a mouse where we're looking at you know, the age of 21 weeks. And we can point out all the structures that we want. And everything looks pretty good here, except there's this little spot 
where it looks a little thickened. It looks like we're getting a little bit of signal dropout. And so we wanted to follow that over time and see what happened. Sure enough, if we imaged it four weeks later, we can see there's, there's a tumor there. If we image it four weeks after that, there's actually two tumors in this location. And if we image it four weeks later, then those tumors have grown. Um, because they, they, they shift around slightly just because the colon is elastic and you can never exactly get your endoscope in the same place. Um, but we could compare it with histology at the end. So we've shown here that we can look at things over time. We can look at structures. We wanted to take it one step further and say, okay, you've basically still, even with your fluorescence technique, have just looked at anatomy. What about things you can't see with your eye? Can we look at biomarkers? And I don't know if anybody in this room um, recognizes any of these things, but EGFR, uh, T, TFR, TGF beta, CXCR2 are all markers that are known to be associated with disease. They're cell surface receptors that get overexpressed in cells that are turning cancerous. And so we said, could we put in a targeted dye now, not looking at natural fluorescence, can we put in a targeted dye to these markers and do they predict where tumors come from or do they show up after tumors? Nobody really knew the answer to that. So um, we'd really like to find something that predicted where tumors would happen. And so we did a study where we took a look at these animals over time and we gave them these different exogenous dyes. We took OCT and we took fluorescence and we simplified the presentation here. So these aren't gonna look like the images I showed you before because we've just simplified down to data. We took the OCT, this axis is rotation around, this axis is length, and we said, if we see a tumor on OCT, we're gonna put a red box. If we don't, it's white. Further, for the laser-induced fluorescence, for the fluorescence, we're gonna put in rainbow what the intensity of that fluorescence is. So when we looked at these animals very early, it's, it's 16 weeks, there was nothing that showed up on OCT, but we saw some spots of fluorescence. Sure enough, four weeks later, and we start seeing a very, very small tumor there, and the fluorescence has gotten much, much brighter. And then later on, we start seeing a bigger tumor, and the fluorescence has gotten huge, and finally we see this, you know, this very large tumor with fluorescence um, occupying almost the entire proximal colon. So this is saying that this particular marker, which in this case was, was TGF-beta-1, is something we ought to be thinking of clinically because it will show up before you can even see anything. Um, anatomically, it will show you where the tumors are likely to come, theoretically, according to our pilot study. So, of course, we would have to go do this in um, people and prove that that happened. So, I forgot to go through my boxes. Okay. So, um, we did a lot of work with mice. They're easy to work with. Um, they're predictable. You can follow them over time. But, you know, sooner or later, you have to go work in people, which in life gets a lot more complicated there. So um, we thought switching gears, it was time to take on the really big challenge of ovarian cancer. And so I went and decided to be smart and actually talk with physicians first and ask them what they wanted. So this is the answer that we got. We want an imaging system that's minimally invasive and non-destructive. And I said, great, that's what we excel at. We want it to have high resolution, ideally show us the cell nucleus shape or identify suspicious areas through molecular imaging like we had done in the mice. We want it to be able to image 10 millimeters deep. We want it to, and the reason for 10 millimeters deep was that you could see all the way through the ovary. Um, we wanted to image markers of proliferation, um, P53 mutations being their very favorite. That's a nuclear marker, it's inside the nucleus easily packaged into a small sterilizable handheld probe, rapid, inexpensive, and I said, eh, yeah, okay, that, that's nice. Um, we can't really do all that. Um, let me tell you what we can do. So the things that we, we knew we had to kind of compromise on were the cell nucleus shape. Neither the OCT or the fluorescence imaging that I showed you is, is cellular level resolution. We can't see cell <laughs> nucleus with that. Um, we could with, with multi-photon microscopy. And actually, um, Professor Jamitro has done this with his confocal microendoscopy. Um, he's shown that he can, he can see the cell nuclei in the ovaries and fallopian tubes. With, um, with, so with confocal systems could do that too. 
Um, we can see suspicious areas with fluorescence imaging. We can't image 10 millimeters deep. Sorry, there's no high resolution optical technology that can image 10 millimeters deep. Uh, we can go two, maybe. Um, we can't image markers in the cell nucleus that aren't fluorescent because we'd have to get a tagged fluorophore in there and the FDA would never allow us to have any agent that would penetrate not just the cells but the cell nuclei and potentially muck with the DNA in reproductive tissue. That's just not going to happen. So we had to say no on that one and we still get complaints that they wish we could image p53 mutations. The rest of the stuff we can do. Um, and we actually decided to just kind of go for it. Let's just build something and get it into the clinic and see if it works. And so our first attempt that we ever did, we built this um, laparoscopic OCT system. So this is OCT only. This is a rigid probe. So all the things I told you about rigid probes being easy are true here. This is made out of stainless steel. It was very robust. It didn't have much in the way of moving parts, except we did have a little motor here in the, hand, in the handle that would simply pull a fiber back. So we didn't do any rotational scanning, just longitudinal. Um, it had pretty bad resolution because we were just using parts that we had available in our lab. Um, and it was reasonably small. This is designed to fit, you know, you have to work with the surgical flow that they have, and they have these trocars that go into the abdomen, and you have to fit through them. So this is one we picked, and, you know, the handle diameter had to be comfortable. We, we ended up having to compromise because we wanted to start with one that was too big, and, you know, the physician said, no, we couldn't do that. So we, we finally managed to compromise on a design, and we did get it into the operating room. Here's a picture of our... Um, uh, gynecolo uh, uh, our gynecological oncologist here, he's got it in his um, right hand. And if you look at the monitor, this is the probe here in contact with the ovary, which is white. This other instrument is just some forceps that are holding it. Um, had an um, optical sciences student there in the back operating the instrument. And we were able to get images. So these images aren't as pretty as some of the ones you saw in the mice. It's always harder to get images under pressure in a breathing under anesthesia human being when you're being told that you have 10 minutes and then you're, you know, you've got to stop and stop interrupting the surgery. Um, but this is the black and white is the OCT image. The pink and purple is the corresponding uh, pathology because all these women were getting their organs taken out anyway. And then so we were able to get old gold standard histology. The normal healthy ovary looks very boring. Uh, that's the way it is. Postmenopausal women don't have much going on in their ovaries. But we could see folds and um, invaginations and things like that, that that were happening. These are actually areas that they used to think were areas where ovarian cancer might have started. Uh, we could see benign cysts, both fluid filled and uh, blood filled. They showed up very, very well. We could see benign conditions like cystadenoma, which have a smooth inner cyst wall against the cyst fluid, you know, as you can also see in the histology. And that looks very different, I hope, even, you know, to the un, um, for, for you who um, are just, you know, looking at this without knowing necessarily what's going on, that it does, this image of a cystadenoma, benign cyst, looks very different than the malignant cyst because this has these streamers going in and the structure is very disrupted. And so we were pretty glad about this, that we were able to go in and we were able to get images in the operating room and we were able to see difference between normal healthy tissue, frank cancer, and some benign conditions. Um, but then we kind of didn't really know what to do next because there were a couple serious problems with what we had just done. Um, we saw that we could tell the difference between these techniques, but you're not going to do a laparoscopic surgery for screening, right? This was fine on women who had already decided to undergo surgery, in which case then it didn't matter that we were taking images. It wouldn't change clinical care at all. What we'd really like to do is to be able to image the ovaries of women who were at high risk and tell them whether or not they had to undergo the surgery because they should undergo a prophylactic surgery to have their ovaries removed because they're likely to go on to have ovarian cancer. Um, so... Couldn't do laparoscopic surgery. Um, we also never imaged any early ovarian cancer because you don't see early ovarian cancer. You see advanced ovarian cancer because it's very rare that women actually are ever caught with early stage ovarian cancer. Um, 
And we couldn't really understand why. Nobody really understood ovarian cancer. It was very confusing. We were looking at the ovaries. We couldn't really figure out why. You, all you ever saw were these, you know, these uh, massively advanced cases. And so we kind of wondered for a while if we were at, uh, at a dead end. Um, and then um, a couple of things changed. You know, things change over time, and I think that's something that I've, I've been in research long enough to realize that um, sometimes you have to wait for advances in medicine and technology to catch up. So one of the things that changed was a paradigm shift. It was originally thought that ovarian cancer started in the ovary. That's the name. <laughs> um, it turns out that ovarian cancer, at least the deadly types of ovarian cancer, are actually fallopian tube cancers. It turns out that um, the origin of those cells is actually the fallopian tube. For whatever reason, you know, rather than, you know, say the epithelium of the ovary going bad and spreading into a cancer, what we think happens is that the epithelium of the fallopian tube goes bad, but nothing really happens. It doesn't proliferate there. But sooner or later, when that cell sloughs off and migrates to the ovary, it's able to grow into a tumor in the ovary, which is why you don't see precancer of the ovaries. So knowing that, we're like, oh, well, we should be looking at the fallopian tubes. Now, maybe you'd still like to look at the ovaries anyway, just to see if anything has metastasized to the ovaries, but we want to look through that. So why don't we just think about going through the fallopian tubes? That would be another way of accessing the ovary. So um, mechanically, the problem with this idea, though, is that it's a, it's a rather tortuous path. Um, you have to go up through the uterus and into the uh, fallopian tubes. There's a very small opening. Um, the entrance to the uterus is only a millimeter in diameter. And furthermore, it's not a nice straight you know, tube. It's floppy and it gets big at the end. So you, you're going to have to be able to steer to look around because it's about a centimeter at the distal end. But we thought we'd like to go ahead and do that because the benefits are that it's, it's minimally invasive. Theoretically, it's maybe on the order of a, of a colonoscopy. You'd have to have, be sedated probably um, for, for pain reasons, but it, it doesn't cut any tissue. Um, it could be very sensitive. And furthermore, we all hope that someday there will be a blood test. There is no good blood test now, and people are saying, well, aren't you worried about a blood test coming and, and taking away your need for imaging? No, we want a blood test because what a blood test would do would be allow us to screen all women, you know, maybe above age 35 for ovarian cancer, and then if you have a suspiciously high blood test, then you're a good candidate to go in for this test because they can never make a blood test that's perfect. Um, it, there's always going to be false positives. Um, and just having a blood test doesn't actually tell you what goes on. The first thing you have to do when you have an abnormal blood test is figure out what's actually going on. So we're looking forward to that. And, and it looks like blood tests for ovarian cancer are starting to become viable. There are some actually promising techniques. The other thing that happened is, you know, technology is getting better, too. We're getting smaller and smaller. It used to be that if you wanted a millimeter diameter optic, people would laugh at you. Nowadays, you, there, are, there are catalog optics that are a millimeter in diameter, not in a great variety, but there are some available. Um, so, you know, our goal was to develop a highly flexible, steerable, 0.8 millimeter diameter OCT and fluorescence imaging falloposcope that could be introduced transvaginally through the uterus and into the fallopian tubes. And I like to think of it not being much bigger than your pencil lead. So it's always easier to look on SolidWorks first. So rather than getting intimidated by the size, um, we decided to start and make sure this would even work and what size components we could work with. So this is um, the design of the falloposcope. We have an imaging bundle. Um, we wanted to use uh, ultraviolet light, so we decided not to use grin lenses. We have a, a three-element lens system. These are 300 micron in diameter, so they're not catalog optics, unfortunately. Um, we have uh, an illumination fiber, uh, multi-mode fiber, to provide illumination for the fluorescence. And then we have the OCT probe, which would um, put light out the side, and that can be very, very small, 125 microns. Um, they're all held together by this ferrule. They've got pull wires on either side so we can steer in one direction and then it would be covered with a sheet and a glass cover plate. Um, looking at the design, um, you know, one of the things that we, I, I love having um, discussions with my students who are here, thank you, um, about 
lens design because you can always do better with more lenses and more curvatures and more exotic curvatures and stuff and so it's always a fun battle to see how few you can actually have. And so we finally compromised on three elements but I said they all have to stack because when you're trying to assemble grains of sand, which is what 300 micron diameter optics are like, you are not going to be able to space them 50 microns apart from each other. That's just not going to work. They all have to stack with each other. They all have, all have to be the same diameter. Furthermore, the side facing the fiber bundle has to be flat so that we can just push the fiber bundle up against it. And the fewer curvatures you can do, the better. So um, this is a really nice, it's, it's 60 degrees in air. Um, stacking lenses of all the same size, only three curvatures, and a planar service. And there's actually um, a stop that's not shown. There is a stop in the system right here, um, a little washer. So we did that, and um, here it is under assembly. It was a lot harder than in SolidWorks putting it together. This is an image through a microscope. These are sutures. The blue things are sutures holding it down. This is a microscope uh, cover slide that we, we put on edge to kind of push things against as we were assembling. But we managed to get the, the three lenses and the stop. There's the ferrule. Here's the fiber bundle, the pull wires, and you can't see the other two fibers are on the other side. Um, we assembled it, and we um, actually had our surgical simulation facility here on campus make us a reproductive trap model to, to test it in. Um, here it is fully built with the handle and the fibers coming out the distal end that connected with our existing fluorescence imaging and OCT consoles. And the, uh, the pull wires did indeed allow us to um, you know, move the, the tip of the endoscope a little bit so we could look side to side. Here's some pictures. Of course, you have to do your Air Force targets, and, and we got really kind of, you know, pretty outstanding considering we only had 3,000 elements in the fiber bundle. We got pretty outstanding performance with it, and um, an, another self-portrait of the, of the Opsi grad student. Um, measuring the image performance, um, just slightly worse than predicted, so that was pretty good considering we didn't, you know, the manufacturer didn't actually test these, so it was best effort. Um, I guess he got pretty close. Um, we could do false color, so rather than putting white light through the scope, we could put red, then green, then blue, and do a false color rendition. That worked. Here's the OCT channel. Um, actually looks pretty good. This is a fallopian tube showing all the structures you'd expect to do. Um, we could also do um, false color fluorescence imaging where we would excite, these are just some fluorophores that we excited with different wavelengths of light and then looked at it with different filters in place, and we could um, recreate through the fiber bundle something that, that pretty much resembled our, our digital camera image. Uh, what that allows us to do was to take images of tissue. This is a porcine reproductive track from the meat lab up Campbell. Um, and what I like about this is that though even though to the eye under white light this all looks kind of pink, um, if you look under fluorescence false color, the follicles are green the fat is yellow, and the collagenous kind of connective tissue is all blue. It's very, very distinct, so that was really nice. So in terms of that study, you know, we've demonstrated that OCT and fluorescence can be used. We've also looked at it in mouse models. I didn't have time to show that today. Um, we've shown that it's possible to build this. We've built a benchtop prototype. We've done some feasibility studies, but we need to actually go into women next, and that's going to be the next hurdle, both um, from a paperwork and from a, you know, doing those things like taking our consoles and making them portable. Um, we want to image very early stage cancer. That's actually changed. We know we can find early stage cancer now in women who have the breast cancer gene, BRCA gene mutations. About one in 10 of them will actually have early stage cancer. Um, so we can actually get a hold of that. That'll be a little bit of a tedious study to do, but we'll be able to. Um, this, as we built it, you know, was built with about a $400,000 DOD grant. Um, yeah. So, you know, that's obviously not going to make it into the market and be successful. We need to build something that's a little more manufacturable, simplify that lens system further, um, even if we take some hits in performance. This was a beautifully performing prototype, but it's, it's not going to be what would eventually sell. Um, and we also need to, um, you know, work with a lot of practitioners, not just our, you know, highly trained top tier physicians that we have here at Banner Medical Center. Um, we have to work with other people. We'd like to get it out more into the community. So looking forward, a couple of other things I just wanted to mention right quick because I'm here. Um, 
we wanted to go back to the idea of can we do multi-photon microscopy, and I would have said before, this is what a multi-photon microscope looks like. You're never going to bring that into the operating room. Um, but this is a picture in Dr. Con Q's lab of his multi-photon <laughs> microscope with a laser that instead of being half an optical table is now the size that's smaller than a shoebox. And furthermore, it turns out you can actually use that same light source to do optical coherence tomography. And um, if we can do that, then I always love to leave with a, with a beautiful picture. Um, this is what ovary tissue will look like under two and three photon imaging, where we can see um, you know, fat cells here. We can see the collagen structure in red. This red outline here is actually a blood vessel wall with individual red blood cells and green flowing through it. There's another one here. Um, so I think that you know, being able to get this level of detail is going to make some physicians pretty excited. So with that, I'll give acknowledgments to a ton of people who were involved in this work and thank my funding sources and thank you.